So we have Professor Michael Murillo as our first instructor, speaker and instructor. He is from Michigan State University and he's joining us from USA. I'll briefly introduce him to all of you. Professor Murillo obtained a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from University of New Mexico and did his PhD from Rice University. He currently holds a professor position and is on the joint faculty of Department of Computational Mathematics, Science and Engineering and Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science at Michigan State University. Before joining Michigan State University, he was a director's postdoc fellow in the theoretical division at Los Alamos National University, LANL. After which he was a channel for many years. Professor Murillo is a theoretical and computational physicist. His research work is focused on particle-based methods for simulating interacting systems of particles using molecular dynamics, fluids, and people, agent-based modeling. I'm sorry, I cannot elaborate more than this. You think for me. As a researcher, he has published about 80 publications in peer-reviewed journals and has trained several PhD and postdocs. And to his name, he's also a fellow of American Physical Society. I came to know about Professor Murillo from one of his postdocs, Vikram Singh. Vikram used to be my junior lab mate at IPI Gandhinagar. We were doing a PhD together. So I came to know Professor Murillo not only as an accomplished researcher, but also as a fantastic person and a very, very nice human being. He can teach us the molecular dynamics, which he will do, but he can also teach many other things. He can teach you how to write a research paper. He can teach you how to write a grant and how to deal with many, many other situations in life. So people are fortunate who have learned from him and we are also fortunate to have this session from him. So without any taking further time, I'll invite Professor Murillo for his talk. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And good morning to all of you. It's wonderful to be here. It's quite an honor. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to mention to you that um, I prefer if this is uh, a discussion and not me just talking. It's obviously this is for you, not for me. So um, if there's anything that's unclear, uh, please stop me and, and we can discuss it. Um, also, if you have some additional insight. I don't know what the what your background is. I think there's probably a diverse set of people here. But if you have some piece of information you would like to add, please add it. Um, this lecture is only uh, one and a half hours, so I can't cover everything. But if you have some interesting insight, please feel free to add it in so we can all learn from you as well. Um, so with that, let me get started. Um, this first lecture for this workshop um, is on, as you can see from my slide, the basics of molecular dynamics. So the idea is to give you just the basic ideas for you to use to become a, a good modeler using this technique and using, um, and using the technique, uh, I would say, well, you know, and, you know, correctly and well and, and, and not make mistakes and, and use it efficiently. So that's the basic idea of what I want to uh, cover today. Uh, Chetan, could you please uh, mute your mic? Okay, so let's get started. So in this, this first part of this lecture, um, I'm gonna cover four different topics. The first topic I'm going to start with is the history and purpose of molecular dynamics. Maybe most of you already know this, but I think it's good to start with 
how we got where we are and why we are here, where this method came from, what it means, how people define it. Just to put it in context of other methods. Um, and then I'll cover three ideas from the molecular dynamics method. And that is um, integrators, ensembles, and forces. Of course, one could cover many, many other topics. But the reason I pick these three is the way I, I see molecular dynamics as a computational method is basically this. We have um, Newton's second law, and we have statistical mechanics. And if we look at Newton's second law, what do we see? We see MA, and what is A? It's the second derivative of the position, x double dot. So to solve the equation, we have to study integrators. And you need to know what the best integrators are. You need to know how to design the integrators and use the best ones. Um, we need to include statistical mechanics. So that's why we need to think about ensembles. It's a very powerful idea that we use in this computational method. And then, of course, on the left-hand side is the forces. And if we don't know what our forces is, we can't start. We don't know what material we have. We don't know what we're simulating. So if I had to pick the three top topics to start with for molecular dynamics, these are the three I would start with. And that's what we're going to go through today. So with that, let me start with the history. One, one of the things that's been interesting for me doing molecular dynamics over the past couple of decades or so is that everybody asked the question, who invented molecular dynamics? When was it invented? Uh, what is, how do you define molecular dynamics? How is it distinct from other methods? So I spent some time thinking about this and I actually went back pretty far in history, all the way back to a guy by the name of Isaac Newton. And one could argue that Isaac Newton is the first person to do molecular dynamics. Why is that? Well, he's the first person obviously to uh, write down Newton's laws. So no one could have done it before him. So he would be the first person who could possibly do it. And we, um, we know that he was interested in, in looking at planetary systems. So you can ask yourself, do you think Newton was the first person to do molecular dynamics? It's a good question. His work was obviously on macroscopic systems like planetary systems, but that is from a computational perspective, that is a particle-based method. Of course, he didn't have the algorithms and the computers yet, but he was definitely thinking about the same sorts of problems that we're thinking about today with MD. Shortly after him, along came a guy by the name of D'Alembert, and he's well known in the MD community because what he did shortly after Newton, Newton wrote down these equations, he invented calculus, and he gave us differential equations. D'Alembert came along and said, Let's develop approximation schemes so that we can approximately solve these equations that Newton gave us. But of course, they were doing it just with pencil and paper because they didn't have computers yet. So um, he invented some algorithms way back then um, that we still use today. And one of them I will derive later in this lecture, which is called the Verlet algorithm, was actually invented long before Verlet um, and long before there were actually computers. So you might argue that D'Alembert was the first person to do MD because he was the first person thinking about actually solving the equations numerically. And, and that was possibly the first person to do MD. Now you might say, no, 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 not Newton, not D'Alembert. I define MD to use a computer, okay? It's okay if that's what your definition is. If you use that as your definition, you need to have computers. And as you know, computers didn't really come around until around the 1950s. And that would then be the, the decade. The 1950s would be the decade where we would say, yes, we now have the computers, we have the algorithms, we have the uh, physics, and we have the force laws. We're now finally in a position where we can simulate the world around us with all of these three ingredients. Okay, so that's a possibly another definition of MD is that you have to run it on a computer. Like I said, different people have different definitions. 
So possibly we could set the start date around 1950 or as early as 1650. It's up to you how, how you want to define it. So all of that work during that period of time, as I mentioned, was macroscopic. People knew what they could see. They could see the stars. They could see the moon. They could see the sun. They, they could see the other planets. And of course, just like now, people like to fight. And so a lot of the applied work that they were doing, in, in addition to this basic work, was for the military. And those were simple single particle trajectories. But they were using all of these ideas for pure um, and applied sciences um, back then, but usually at the, at the macroscopic level. And the reason for that is it's surprising in the history of science that the microscopic picture of matter didn't come along until fairly late. People as early as Democritus had the idea of an atom, but he didn't actually know it existed. Dalton posited these kind of hard sphere things, but it was just an idea. Thompson proposed the idea of this of this this uh, atom, which was we know now is incorrect, but he did discover the electron. That was the first time we actually knew that there were particles at the microscopic level. So there was no way we could have done MD of microscopic matter before Thompson and Rutherford, who discovered the nucleus. Now we actually know that the particles that we see, like in a solar system, it's similar at the microscopic scale, but of course we need quantum mechanics to fill that in. And that takes us up to about 1930. So by the time we got to 1950, we, we knew that there were particles and quantum particles at the microscopic level. We had algorithms and we had by the 1950s computers, we were finally in a position to do molecular dynamics. And in, in my view, and other people would disagree with this, so you can come up with your own opinion. In my view, this all started at Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is my former employer. And what happened in, in, at Los Alamos back in the 1950s is they bought one of the first supercomputers called Maniac. And it was um, built by this guy here. His name um, is Nicholas Metropolis. You might have heard of Metropolis because he not only did he run the computer division at Los Alamos in the 1950s, but he's also the inventor of the Metropolis Monte Carlo algorithm. And if you've ever done Monte Carlo, you've probably heard of Metropolis in that context. So what happened was at Los Alamos, it's an exciting story. Metropolis is, gets this new computer. They put it together. You can see it behind him. And they're thinking, what should we do? We can now solve problems we could never solve before. What's it going to be? So what they did is they, they um, said, okay, let's start this new era of high-performance scientific computing. What are we going to do? Let's call Enrico Fermi. And they asked Enrico Fermi, who was now back at University of Chicago, what is the most important problem that we could do with a computer at the microscopic level? And he said, what we don't understand is the second law of thermodynamics. We don't understand entropy. And the way they phrased it back then is we don't understand ergodicity. And that is, what is the rate of approach to equilibrium of energy among various degrees of freedom? And why was that? Is up till then, they could not solve a many body, a nonlinear many body problem. It was just not possible. They didn't have the computers. They could think about it. They could do the linear version, but they were unable to address specifically nonlinear problems. And Enrico Fermi, he thought that was the most important thing. So he goes to Los Alamos during the summer and puts together a team of people. And that led to this very famous problem that you might have heard of because people still study this problem today called the Fermi Pasta Ulam Singu problem. This was the original paper. You can see it's in the middle of the 1950s. These are the three guys, Fermi, Pasta, and Ulam. And nowadays we know who really did the work. The person who really did the work um, was Mary Singu. Oh, by the way, uh, Ulam also worked with Metropolis on the Monte Carlo method. But Mary Singu is the person who actually did the work. So the first person who really did MD actually coded it up 
was uh, Mary Singu. So this is the first MD person um, ever, if you define MD this way. And what was the problem they were solving? It was actually a very simple problem. They wrote down this equation. You can see the, the left-hand side, x double dot, that's the second time derivative. And the right-hand side, this term is linear. This is the part they, they understood. Um, and what it is, is it springs. And this is a spring to the right. This is a spring to the left. And this is the connection between the two springs and it's linear. And they added to it a proportionality constant. And then these two terms, and you can see these are nonlinear, they're quadratic. They actually changed these uh, nonlinear terms to different forms, but this is one of them. And they did a simulation with a grand total of 64 particles. So they basically solved a second order ordinary differential equation system with nonlinear springs uh, between them for 64 particles. And that problem today is called the FPUT problem. And it is, like I said, it is still so important. It's studied today. So let me give you a sense for what they found because it's very profound. And, and the reason I want you to know this is because when MD was invented, almost everything that people did was a major discovery. And this is an example. So let's look at this. This is from a YouTube video. I'll go through it a little bit quickly and fast forward. So you, we don't have to spend four minutes. But the basic idea was that if you have a linear system, you can do a molecular dynamic simulation like this. And if all of the interactions are linear, the mode structure stays the same. So at the bottom, these horizontal lines are what are the modes? So think in terms of like Fourier analysis. It stays in the initial mode. It's just whatever that wavelength is that you see there, that's where it stays. Look at this one. You have, you have uh, twice the frequency or twice the wave vector stays in that mode. Whatever mode you pick, it stays there. Therefore, energy can't leave that mode. That means that the physical system can never go to equilibrium entropy can never increase. So what they did is they put the nonlinear interactions in there, as you can see here on the, on the right. And now what you notice, the behavior at the top is much more complicated. And if you look at the bottom, look at the mode structure. You're losing energy out of the main mode and all of that energy is going into all of the other modes. The energy is being shared. It's, it's, it's a visual, representation of equipartition. The system is going to a thermodynamic equilibrium state. And it was just instantly visible to, to Mary Singu, who did the simulations, um, when she saw this. And that's like a major discovery in nonlinear science. And therefore, a lot of the nonlinear science we do today uh, refers back to this problem. But that's not the only thing that they discovered. They discovered something else that, in my opinion, is way more interesting, and that's this. If you wait long enough, it returns to its original state. Think about that. You have a many-body system with nonlinear interactions, and if you wait long enough, it's periodic. And they discovered that fact by accident. So it's an amazing story. So that's how we got started. There's many, if you get interested in the history of MD, I, I encourage you to go read about it. There's many, many more stories like this one. This one I picked because I think it's the first one. Um, and obviously it's from Los Alamos. I'm slightly biased, um, but you can find other stories just like this one. Um, amazing discoveries were made and amazing discoveries are still being made maybe by you. So let's keep on going and move on. So how would we, fast forwarding to today, how would we define molecular dynamics? Most of us would think about it probably as a microscopic method, but there's no reason you can't apply it to macroscopic objects like planets and stars and galaxies. And some people do, some people do. Um, we usually think of it as a purely computational technique. We're not doing this on a piece of paper, we're doing this in a computer usually. 
Um, and it solves directly the equations of motion of a many body system. Like, like you see here on the right, a very complicated many body system. We just directly put in the particles. It's a particle based simulation method. And we are going to just brute force solve it, you know, to, to as few approximations as possible. And we'll talk about the approximations as I go on. Okay, so if you think about what I've talked about so far, Newton's second law, if you look at the equations that Mary Singu was solving, they're ordinary differential equations, which means that they're deterministic. So every time I run my code, I'm going to get exactly the same answer every single time. Now, typically, even though Newton's laws are deterministic in that sense, Molecular dynamics is often stochastic for, for multiple reasons. Um, one reason that is always there is you never know your initial condition. So let's just take the picture on the right. You don't know what the position and velocity is of all of these particles perfectly in the initial state, nor do you actually care, right? All you care about is that you can describe them well enough that you get the statistical properties accurate. And usually that's enough. If you knew some crystal structure, you might try to match it, but you never really know the exact positions. And you don't really, like I said, you often you don't, you don't care either. So you have a level of stochasticity simply because you use random numbers to initialize the system after which it's deterministic. So that's a type of, of stochasticity. The other thing I'll talk about later, which is really important in MD, is sometimes we put random terms into the equations of motion on purpose to mimic certain physical effects like temperature. Like how do you get temperature into a molecular dynamics code? One way to do that is to take the ordinary differential equations and make them stochastic differential equations. And I'll talk about that later. But that's sort of an, in a, a detail. Okay. So moving on, um, let's go to the next segment. So we saw a little bit of history there and how this all came about and the different definitions and purposes of what MD can do and the sort of amazing discoveries that we can make with it. Now let's actually break it apart and see how we actually build a computational tool and use it wisely and correctly. And let's start with um, integrators. Okay. So integrators. So as we looked at, we can formulate molecular dynamics in terms of Newton's second law. And I'm using that here because it's maybe a little bit simpler. I think most people, including me, would typically start with a Hamiltonian description. It's a little bit cleaner for doing MD, and I'll use it a little bit later. But if you like Newton's laws better or Hamilton equations better, or even Lagrangian, that's fine too. You can use whatever you want. You, know, you can go back and forth. Okay, so we have Newton's second law, we look at it and we see a differential equation. We know we have to integrate this equation. That is what MD is. So in the case of um, Fermi, Pasta, Ulam, Singu, they had a force law like this for like a linear spring. The force law can be whatever you want. We'll talk about that in great detail soon. Um, but in the end, what we have is a second order differential equation that can be broken up into two first order differential equations. And we usually solve the equations numerically by breaking up into first order equations instead of solving a second order equation. And later I'll show you why that's typically done. So, but in the end, we have two ordinary differential equations in this model. One of them is just in terms of the velocity, which is just a variable. And the other one's in terms of the force, which you have to provide because that defines your system. And then the other thing that you have to provide are the initial conditions. And as I mentioned, the initial conditions are usually chosen. They're very problem dependent, obviously. Um, and they are also chosen often uh, randomly. So for example, let's suppose you have a classical system that's near equilibrium. You might choose these initial velocities to be sampled from a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution or something like that but it really depends on the problem that you're solving. But you do have to, uh, the first step of starting an MD code, as we'll talk about, is providing what is the initial configuration 
And then with an integrator, we can evolve it from there. Okay. And like I said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to stop me. Okay. So let's go through a simple example for those of you who haven't um, done integrators in a little while. I'm, I assume most of you have done this before, but just as a reminder, when we do, when we build integrators for molecular dynamics, we do it in a very specific way. We don't use uh, normal integration techniques and you'll see why. So let's work through an example. Let's suppose we have this case dx dt equals v, dv dt equals minus x. And you might remember that is the simple harmonic oscillator. It's just an oscillator. Just goes back and forth. Nothing particularly interesting about it. Okay. So that's our simple harmonic oscillator. So what we're going to do is we're going to discretize these equations by taking the left-hand side and discretizing them. And what we get is are these um, update equations. So the top equation is X at the next time step. I'm imagining e equal time steps of Delta T. So the position of the particle or particles at the next time step is equal to the value at the beginning of the time step times the length of the time step times the velocity at the beginning of the time step. Notice that there's a T, a T and a T plus Delta T. That will matter in a second. Same for velocity. This is the velocity at the end of the time step in terms of the velocity at the beginning of the time step and the position at the beginning of the time step. Okay. That seems very tedious, but you'll see why I'm being very tedious about this. It's important. And so what happens is if I put this on the computer, you should do it. Um, you'll, get a, you'll get a plot that looks like this. Now, this is being plotted in what's called phase space. So this axis is at the bottom is a, is a position variable, so x. And this axis here in phase space is the velocity of the particle. So with a simple harmonic oscillator, it speeds up, it reverses direction and speeds up and, it re and reverses direction. And so that's what you see here. It's, it's slow and to the right, moves to the left and speeds up, stops, moves back to the right, and it just goes around in a circle in phase space. In physical space, it just goes back and forth. In phase space, it's going in a circle because it's speeding up and slowing down and reversing direction while it's doing that. So phase space is a nice way to look at this. And what if you work out the math, it should be a circle. And it is a circle. Look at that beautiful circle. Success. Now, if we have a force law, that's different from the simple harmonic oscillator, we know what to do. We just discretize it and we use the forward Euler method, which is an explicit method, which means everything from the beginning of the time step is on the right. Everything at the end of the time step is on the left. We code it up and we're good. We can all stop right now and write an MD code. I think that's what we should do. Except there's one problem. And the problem is if you look at this, Notice that the trajectory is going outward. It's spiraling outward. And if you work through the math, the radius of this circle is proportional to the energy in the system. And if I run this for a really long time, it's going to keep spiraling outward. And I can control it by making my time step really small. So whenever you're running an MD code, you're going to have to pick what's my time step. And what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to pick it really small because you don't want your system to constantly gain energy because you, you, your physical system that you're modeling probably has a fixed energy. And so this behavior that you see here where it's spiraling outward is actually a disaster. You, you can't make an MD code using this method. It just doesn't work. So. Let's keep on going. So if you, if you remember from integrators, you say, oh, I know how to fix that. That's an explicit integrator. I'm gonna to switch to an implicit integrator or an implicit solver, which is not forward Euler, it's backward Euler, okay? And the, the difference is forward Euler uses the derivative at the beginning of the time step, but that seems wrong, right? If we're taking a jump across the time step, doesn't it seem like it would be better to use the derivative at the end of the time step since after all, that's where we're going. So let's try that. 
So let's use the derivatives at the end of the interval. So now this is why I was being so tedious before. I have my position at the beginning of the time step, but now my velocity is at the end of the time step, which is where I'm going. That makes more sense. And here the, the, the position is also at the end of the time step where I'm going. And these are called implicit because now I have V of T plus Delta T on the right side of the equation and the left side of the equation and same for X. So I can't solve these equations in the same way because of this implicitness. Now in this particular case, I actually can do it analytically, but in general, you cannot. You have to do some sort of uh, matrix inversion. But for these equations, the reason I picked the simple harmonic oscillator is because I can actually do it by hand. And what I get are these equations. And what you see is very fascinating. I can actually solve by just a two by two matrix inversion, the velocity at the end of the time step and the position at the end of the time step. And notice that I have a denominator down here. And what that does is it gives me effectively all powers of delta t. It's, it's as if I have an infinite order method. And it makes it so that this method is a lot more stable. And this is why people use implicit methods. They're very, very stable. And in this case, I could invert it by hand. So if I were doing MD of a simple harmonic oscillator, you would think definitely want to use this, right? Let's find out. Okay, so here's the answer for backward Euler. Mostly looks like a success. I get a nice circle, just what I want. But now you know where the story is going. Notice instead of spiraling outward, it's spiraling inward. Not good. So in fact, by, by making a solver that's much more sophisticated and requires a matrix inversion, so let's look, look at, let's, since the implicit solver wasn't um, any better, let's look at another one. And this one is what I call an uh, integrator um, that occurs when you make a mistake. I think the first time I wrote an MD code, I made this mistake. And here's what I did. I first coded up the velocity using forward Euler because I was just being lazy. And then I coded up the position next also, I, in my brain, I'm thinking forward Euler, and I write it down, but notice that in the computer, because I have already calculated V here, if I use it on the next line, it appears here. This is actually the velocity at the next time, at the next step. How do I know what it is? Because I just computed it. It's because of the specific order. So I'm doing this one like forward Euler, and I'm doing this one like backward Euler, but notice I don't have to invert a matrix because the ordering of the equations allows me to pre-compute this. And, and, and I, I think of it as like a mistake. You might actually code this up and you might do this by accident, thinking you're doing forward Euler, but you're accidentally doing a little bit of forward Euler and a little bit of backward Euler. And you can imagine that must be like terrible. Right? So this is what happens. You get a perfect circle. Mm. And this integrator is so good that it has a name. It's called the Cromer Euler method. And what it's telling you is there's something about MD integrators that have a certain symmetry that if you find the symmetry, the integrators are nearly perfect. And if you don't find that symmetry, you will gain energy or you'll lose energy or whatever. So the mystery is, what is it about making this mistake that gives me essentially a perfect integrator? That's the question. And here's a comparison. You can see here, here's backward Euler, spiraling inward, Forward Euler, as I said, spirals outward. Backward Euler is losing energy. Forward Euler is gaining energy. And this one called Cromer Euler is staying exactly on the exact solution for all time and conserving energy.
So that's amazing. So whenever you use an MD code, it's really important that you know what integrator you're using because it makes a big difference. And some of them are much better than the others. So that one's perfect. Okay. So here's, a, here's sort of an idea about integrators. If you ever use integrators in any science you do, if you're in a hurry, you're going to use forward Euler just because it's quick. You can code it up very quickly. If the problem is stiff, the rule you're going to use is use a backward Euler or an implicit method. If you're like me and you're super lazy, you're probably going to go grab Python and get something like solve IVP and grab some routine that's in there. And what's interesting about picking integrators for whatever science problem you're, you're working on, there's another option, which is to pick an integrator that is very, very adapted to your system. And this is what we do in MD. We don't pick any of these integrators. None of them are very good. So what we do is we say, let's look at the actual equations we're solving and do they have special properties? And if you write the equations as Hamilton's equations instead of Newton's equations, the symmetry is apparent to you and you can build integrators like I showed you that are nearly perfect every time. And that allows you to do not only accurate molecular dynamics, but it's very, very stable and you can run MD for a very long time without worrying about that instability that the Euler methods gave you. So yes, Hamilton is special and we should try to see if we can find an integrator that's consistent with it. And it tries to um, preserve the conservation laws that Hamilton has. Most ordinary differential equations that you solve don't have conservation laws. So there's no reason to look for it. But in our case, we want to invent integrators that automatically preserve certain properties that are in our physical system. We don't want a generic integrator. We want an MD integrator. And so here's how that goes. What we do is we move from Newton's laws to a Hamiltonian structure. And if you haven't seen Hamiltonian structure, you basically, you have a Hamiltonian, which has a kinetic energy piece. We simply add up all the kinetic energies of all the particles, because it's a many body system in general. There's a potential energy term, which we add to get the total energy. And we write that in some form. In this case, it's pair potentials between the particles. And we'll get to that in a bit. And then these are the differential equations that are called the Hamilton equations. And you simply take this H. This is always the same because it's just the kinetic energy. Depending on what material that you're working on is going to change what this value of U is. And once you know what that is, you plug it in here. You have your equation of motion. But what do you notice here? One of the things you notice is there's a definite symmetry here. There's a P here and an X here. There's an X here and there's a P here. There's always an H here. There's always an H here. There's a plus here and there's a minus here. Those specific symmetries are the things that lead to the Hamiltonian dynamics that preserves the conservation laws and has what's called a symplectic character. And what we want to do is invent integrators for our MD codes that capture all of those properties. So going through a little bit of math, just in case you ever find this, is you see this in the MD literature sometimes. So it's good to be aware of this if you haven't seen this, like in a classical mechanics class. But the basic idea is you take different observables and combine their derivatives like this. And that gives what's called a Poisson bracket. It seems useless, but you can write the Hamilton equations in terms of Poisson brackets. Doesn't seem useful yet, but it will be. And you can write the time derivative of any observable in terms of the Poisson bracket. So when you generalize classical mechanics, what you find is that the, the Poisson bracket is actually appearing everywhere. So why don't we just define it to be an operator, which is called the Liouville operator. Seems like we're making the problem 
much more complicated, but let's see if we, if it actually adds some advantage to us. So what we do is we notice that the formal solution of all of these equations is the time derivative of any observable is the Liouville operator operating on that observable. So formally, we can solve this equation and we find that the observable at time t is e to this operator times the initial value. I just solved all of classical mechanics exactly for all time. We're done. This is the exact solution of every classical mechanics problem. You give me a force law, I put it in a Hamiltonian, I get the Liouville operator, and this is the exact solution. The problem is this is still quite complicated. So we have to um, take our formally exact solution and keep going. But one of the things that we can look at it is we can we find that there's some observations that you could make. It's time reversible. And, and it preserves all of these properties. Like we talked earlier, systems are periodic. It preserves that. So this is great. This situ situation is not general. It's not like RK45 or some other integrator. It's a specific integrator that is adapted for MD. And here's the most important thing that you can get out of this. And you'll see this when you do MD all the time. What you do is you take this exact evolution operator and you break it up into multiple pieces. And what's beautiful is you get to pick what those pieces are. What most people do is they break it up into kinetic energy here, kinetic energy here, and potential energy here, or the reverse. Potential energy terms here, potential energy terms here, and kinetic energy terms here. And then each of these operators, it turns out, can be evaluated exactly. It's really, really gorgeous. And then you operate with this exactly. Then you operate with this exactly. Then you operate with this exactly. And you get an approximation to the exact evolution. And by writing it in this form, which if you haven't seen this before, it probably looks very complicated to you. But it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. By writing it this way, it's exactly time reversible. It's, it's exact to a certain order. It's symplectic. It, it preserves all these properties, even though it might look kind of messy to you. But by breaking it into these three operators, we get three shifts of our system, which leads to three update equations. This first equation arises from application of this operator. The second equation arises from the application of this operator after this one has been applied. And then this one generates the third equation after this one has been applied, which is after this one is applied. So you can see this is the first operator generates something at delta t over two because there's a t over two here. Then that ends up being used in here. This looks like the euler cromer then that generates an update to the position, which then gets used in the final operator. So this appears in the forces at the next time step. And this integrator that you see here, this particular one is called the velocity verlet integrator. And it is by far the most widely used integrator in all of molecular dynamics. If you just take molecular dynamics code, like I don't know what code you guys are using, like lamps or VASP or whatever you're using. And I guarantee if you don't think about it and you don't do anything, it's probably using the velocity verlet algorithm. And what it is, is it's basically the second order version of the Euler Cromer. So you remember the Euler Cromer looked perfect. This is even better than that. And that's why it's in every MD code. And anytime somebody invents a new integrator, they usually build it on top of this structure, which is why I didn't want to show you all this formalism because it's very complicated, but you see this in the literature because people invent, for example, maybe you want a new integrator for a system that has magnetic fields. This is where you would start. If you want to build an integrator for a system that has very different time scales, this is where you would start. So it's very general theory and it yields all of the commonly used integrators. Okay, so this is just showing how each of these operators generates these equations, which I talked about. 
Okay. So now we have a good sense for integrators. Even though I'm leaving integrators now, it's a whole subfield. I, I've published papers on this. It's a super interesting topic. I think you could make your MD codes do a lot, uh, be much more efficient if you think about this. On the other hand, if you're using an MD code mostly as a black box, what's important is just that you know, I better choose a good time step and I better choose the best integrator for my problem because probably a code like LAMPS or something is going to have like dozens of integrators in it. So, okay, so let's move to ensembles. This is the part where we do statistics because we're not always in a simple system. Everything that I've been talking about so far is what we call in statistical mechanics, the NVE ensemble, ensemble, which is a fixed number of particles, fixed volume and fixed energy, sometimes called the micro canonical ensemble, which just basically means energy is conserved, particles are conserved. That's like Newton's laws. That's like Hamilton's equations. And if you imagine, yeah, sure, energy is conserved, particles are conserved. I always want to do this, right? This is a really good idea. Well, you might ask yourself, could it be a bad idea to do it that way? And the answer is, sometimes it's a really good idea to make sure that the energy is conserved, get that perfect circle like I showed you. But sometimes you have a situation where that's not true. If you have a system that's at constant temperature, then by definition, the energy is fluctuating. And I think most of us, when we work with real physical systems, they're usually specified not at a given energy. They're usually specified at a given temperature. So in a sense, everything that I've been talking about so far really can't be applied to most systems. We have to think about what does temperature mean and how do we modify the equations that we've seen so far to include temperature, which means there's going to be energy fluctuations. So one thing we have to do first is define temperature. And here's sort of a kinetic theory definition. It's M over three times the expectation value of the velocity squared. And this is actually a time dependent definition. So if your temperature is varying in time, this definition would work. And this is how you define temperature. And uh, here I, I write out the brackets are just an average. And the V squared here is the dot product of the velocities of the ith particle. Okay, so that's just the definition of temperature. So what's really nice is if you have this definition of temperature and you run your MD code, you can take the output and you can examine what the temperature is. Okay, and what you'll find if you did it with NVE ensemble is that this quantity will be fluctuating. And you think that's not right because my system is at a constant temperature. I want my temperature to be constant and I want my energy to fluctuate, not the other way around. Okay, so what are you gonna do? There's a lot of ways of doing it. Um, I'm only going to cover five different thermostats. There's a lot of them. And the reason I'm going to cover so many of them is because, again, if you write your own code or you're using one of these commercial codes, it's going to have a lot of options. And it's good to know what the difference is, because some of them can give bad results and some of them can be used in creative ways. I'll try to go through them kind of quickly. Okay, so let's start with velocity scaling. That's kind of the most obvious what you do is you compute the current temperature using that formula that I just showed you in your code. And it tells you the temperature right now is whatever, five, okay? And then what you do is you, you compare it with what you want your temperature to be. Maybe I want my temperature to be three in some units, but I just calculated it and it's five. That's bad. So what I do is I take the ratio of the temperature that's actually happening in my code with the temperature that I want it to be. And I take the ratio and I relate that to the square of the velocities. And it tells me if I scale my velocities by a certain amount, I'll move all the velocities down by the right amount. I'll take my temperature of five and I will make it a temperature of three. So basically I take the ratio of my current temperature in the MD to my target. 
and I simply take the square root of it and I scale my velocities. And now the temperature in my AMD code is exactly what I want it to be. Hi. So, so yeah, the extreme, yeah. excuse me. So, so in this method, can we ask that person to mute? Should we continue? Okay. So typically when you implement this, you, you would do this at every single time step. Check the temperature, see if it's good, scale the velocities. Check the temperature, see if it's good, scale the velocities, and you get an MD simulation at the constant temperature that you desire. Perfect. The problem with that method is it's like kind of harsh. It's like constantly jerking the velocities. The velocities want to go here and it's jerking them back. The velocities want to go over here and it's jerking them back. So Berenson invented a, a nice way to make that smoother by thinking about it as a relaxation differential equation where you go from your current temperature to the target temperature slowly over a time scale tau, which is not one step, but it might be 10 steps, okay? It makes it smoother and less, you know, unphysical. And so you can work through the math and basically what you end up with is a new equation that tells you how to scale your velocities. It's just velocity scaling, but it's in a way that's a little bit more gentle so that it doesn't like jerk the system as much. And that's the Berenson thermostat. It's just a modification of the idea of velocity scaling. Now, these are kind of intuitive, I would say, these thermostats, and you might want to use them in your career. If you want to use thermostats, their velocity scaling and Berenson are really easy to implement. Um, but people thought about this a little bit more deeply. And I think the person who thought about this in the MD community most deeply is Nose. And what he did is he said, look, I want to preserve classical statistical mechanics, which is the canonical ensemble, the NVT ensemble. And I'm not sure that velocity scaling really does the statistical mechanics correctly. So what he did is he invented, is brilliant. What he did was absolutely brilliant. He invented a new Hamiltonian that has these extra degrees of freedom. And these extra degrees of freedom, think of them like a bath. It's like the environment. So think about these like the environment. This is like the kinetic energy of the environment. And this is the potential energy of the environment. So I have this extra degree of freedom. This, this like this environment that's like interacting with my system. And how does it interact? Through this factor right here. So I have this extra degrees of freedom, which is my environment. And it's changing my kinetic energy. Just exactly what you imagine would happen when you have a system at a finite temperature. It's very beautiful. And it turns out, and what he proves in this paper, if you want to go through the math, is when you stick this into the classical mechanics equation, even though this is a Hamiltonian that conserves energy, this part of it, the, your system, that you're looking at exactly obeys the canonical ensemble. It's really quite gorgeous. And so that's that if you implement that, if you implement this Hamiltonian, you are implementing the Nose thermostat. And it has this is really elegant, really elegant. Okay. So one of the things that's nice about it, you might say, should I use velocity scaling? Should I use Berenson? Should I use Nose? I would say that if you use Nose, you know for sure you're getting the real canonical ensemble. And the other thing is, is if you implement it, the overall Hamiltonian has a conservation law. It has a conserved energy. It's not the system. It's not the energy of your system. It's, your, it's the energy of your system plus the environment. But that's okay. If you're trying to debug your code, it's really nice to have a conserved quantity just so that you can check it. And so that's an advantage of using Nose. Okay, 
So let's go to another method that I mentioned, which is Brownian motion. And this is um, a really powerful technique because it really takes the idea of nose to a, a literal level where you actually imagine that there's little particles out there that are bouncing into the particles in your simulation and they're forming like a bath. The environment is filled with all of these particles. Maybe they're like photons or really small particles like water molecules or whatever it is. And that generates this Brownian motion. And so that idea is, is what we think about when we have like a system that's an open system where we're exchanging energy with it. So again, this is very much consistent with what we think about when we think about a system at finite temperature. We're, interact, we're, in, we're in an open environment interacting with um, a bath of particles on the outside. Okay, And what we do is we take Newton's laws, which are ODEs, and we add two terms. One of them is a drag term. And that would still keep it as an ODE. And then we add a noise term, which is a stochastic. This is a random variable. And it makes this system of equation SDEs or stochastic differential equations. And this set of equations with these fluctuations in it and this dissipation term is called the Langevin equation. And personally, I, I really like the Langevin equation better than the other methods. For, for basically one reason, as a thermostat, it works as well or better than Nose. But the other thing I like about it is it's it actually can be used for physics. Sometimes when you want to just not pay attention to some particles, like you have a lot of water molecules and you just don't want to simulate them because it's too expensive, you include the bath particles explicitly in the, these fluctuation dissipation terms and allows you to run your code in a much faster mode. In other words, you can use these not just as a thermostat, but you can use them to mimic physics to make your code run faster. And I've done that where I'm simulating ions and I don't want to track the electron time scale. So I put the electrons in here and I simulate on the ion time scale. And that's a huge time scale difference because of the mass ratio. So the Langevin equation is, is super powerful technique for physics reasons and as a thermostat. Okay, this is a lot of equations. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing because it's actually pretty easy. If you look at the black parts of the equations, you'll notice that you've seen the black parts before, that's velocity relay. And what did I tell you? Once you see velocity relay, you're gonna keep seeing it over and over and over again. So this integrator, these three guys, Brunger, Brooks, Karplus, BBK integrator, like I said earlier, they built it on top of velocity relay. So they basically combined Langevin, which I showed in Newton's laws, they combined Langevin on top of velocity relay. That way, if, if there's no bath, their integrator automatically reverts back to velocity relay and has all of those beautiful features that I talked about earlier. But this self-consistently adds the bath so it can be used to mimic physics of the environment or it can be used as a thermostat and it's built on top of this symplectic second order velocity relay. Incredibly powerful uh, method, the BBK integrator. But you see the basic idea here. When you're writing an MD code or you're running an MD code, you have a lot of integrators you can pick and you have a lot of thermostats that you can pick. And it's good to know which ones are good and what they're good for, what the problems are, which ones are fast, which ones are slow, which ones can be used for physics, which ones are less physical. It's good to keep all of that in your mind so that you don't grab a code and accidentally run the defaults and they don't really apply to the problem that you want to work on. So, okay, so this is just a comment on, this is where the randomness comes in. So you actually, this makes some stochastic differential equations. The R term here actually comes from using random numbers in your code. So it is an SDE, stochastic differential equation. Okay, now one thing that I wanted to point out is it's important sometimes to turn your thermostat off. And it depends on your problem. 
a, here's a question for you. You're doing a simulation of whatever you're interested in. Maybe you're doing material science. Maybe you're doing biochemistry. Whatever it is that you're working on, should you keep the thermostat on or not? Because if it's on, it's going to change. It changes the equations of motion. I mean, look at this. The equations of motion are different. So is the physical process that you're looking at the black terms or the black and green terms? So you have to ask yourself, should I keep the thermostat on or off? And it really, I can't give you an answer. It really depends on the problem. If you're using the thermostat to equilibrate your system to a fixed temperature, you might want to turn the thermostat off once you have reached that temperature so that these stochastic terms don't mess up the dynamics. Like, remember I talked about velocity scaling is constantly jerking around the dynamics. You don't want to measure that. That's not physical. So whenever you're using a thermostat, you have to ask yourself, should I keep it on when I take data? Should I turn it off when I take data? If I'm using like a Langevin for physics, I have to keep it on because I'm trying to keep my physics on. If I'm using Langevin just as a thermostat, I might want to turn it off. But like I said, I can't tell you which one you should do because it's, it's, it's really up to what you are doing for your particular problem. I think what I see when I talk to people who do MD all around the world, a lot of people leave it on because they want to make sure to maintain a fixed temperature. So one trick that you can use is you can make the thermostat very strong while you're equilibrating, trying to get your system to the right temperature. And then when you take data, you just make the thermostat very weak. That means it's not going to mess up the dynamics, but it's going to still steer your system towards the right temperature. There's a lot of options to play with there. You just got to be aware of it and make sure that when you do your runs, you're, you're doing it that's consistent with what your goals are. Okay. Brownian dynamics is just a name uh, for a different type of MD method. You see people talk about MD. You see people talk about BD. Maybe some of you are doing BD. What BD basically means is I have a bath and I'm doing something like Langevin or BBK. It's just a name that explicitly says I have a bath and I have an SDE equation in my simulation. I'm including actual bath forces and explicit forces between the particles. That's what BD or Brownian dynamics communicates. If you ever see that term, which you probably will, that's what it means. Okay. Hoover came along. He's a, a Hoover is a very famous person in the world of molecular dynamics. He uh, did some of the beautiful early work. He came along and made another thermostat and you can see is, is really nice. This part right here looks like Newton's laws, Newton's second law. This part looks like a Langevin term. So you might think, what did he do new? There's nothing new here. What he did, which is really actually quite clever, is he made the drag term here from Langevin time dependent. And if it's time dependent, it has to have its own equation. And this is the equation for this drag term. And you can see what it is. This is the temperature that you're trying to go to. This is the actual value of the temperature that you're measuring. Remember from velocity scaling. So this is basically a measurement of your current temperature. This is your target temperature. And whether you're high, high or low, or you're exactly at the right temperature affects the drag term, which affects this. And if it were zero, nothing would happen. And you would revert quite naturally back to the NVE ensemble with no thermostat. It's gorgeous. And what he proved is that this is almost impossible to tell when you look at this is, is the same as Nose. And so if you go look in any MD code, you're probably going to see the Nose Hoover thermostat. You're probably not going to see the Nose. You're probably not going to see Hoover. You're probably going to see Nose Hoover because Hoover invented this new version and proved that it's doing the same thing as Nose. 
I kind of like this because it's very intuitive. Okay, one, one warning is that Nose can have problems because if I have a single bath particle, it can actually get um, correlated with the particles in the system. So they, uh, Nose and Hoover came up with this idea of a uh, Nose Hoover chain, which means your bath particle is connected to a bath and that particle is connected to a bath and that particle is connected to a bath. Mm -hmm. And that causes, that gives you a chain of baths or what they call in the MD community, Nose Hoover chains. So again, if you're writing a code or you're using a code, you probably want to include Nose Hoover chains more than just the standard Nose Hoover, just to make sure that you don't run into this problem that people have discovered. And so you might want to just be aware of that issue. I mean, you can go read about it in the literature, but any code that you're going to write or use will probably have chains in it. Okay. So where are we? We've talked a lot about the history of MD and how it came about, what its purpose is. We know how to develop enormous number of integrators and we can see, we, I showed you why it's really important to use good ones. We know how to build them using the Leoville operator formalism. We can make whatever new integrators we want. We talked about ensembles. Now I talked about ensembles here in a really limited way because I only have so much time to talk to you. Um, and I focused on thermostats. You might find yourself, especially if you're doing like maybe a biological problem, that you don't have constant energy and you don't have constant temperature, but you actually have something else like constant pressure. You could do the same thing for constant pressure. They're called barostats. There's a lot of stats out there that are basically constraints on different things. Hugonio stats. There's a lot of them. So if you find yourself working on a physical problem in chemistry, biochemistry, plasma physics, whatever, that has a different statistical constraint, there's probably a stat for it, like a barrow stat. So I just want to tell you that because I didn't, I could talk for hours on ensembles. Okay. So now let's talk about forces. And I left that for the end because it is arguably the most important thing that you will worry about. Because I could, I could argue, okay, if, I, if you're going to do an integrator, just pick velocity of relay. If you're going to be using finite temperature, just pick Nose Hoover chains and you're good or Langevin. Just the, you're, you're, those might be your defaults and you don't have to worry about them because other people have already made these discoveries. And as long as you set them in your code, you're going to be pretty good. If that's how you want to do MD, that's a safe way to do it. But the forces, that is not safe at all. That really, really is up to you to make that decision. You are responsible for that part of it. No one can help you. So that's why I saved that for the end because it's really important. Okay, so let's go through this. So sometimes we talk about forces. Sometimes we talk about potentials. The force is just minus the gradient of the potential. Okay, so that's just... They're just interchangeable ideas. One's the derivative of the other one. So don't get too, too confused. But the reason that these things are so important for you to be aware of is you can turn an MD code into something that simulates water. And the next day it can simulate graphite. And the next day it can simulate plastic. And the next day it can simulate a quark glue on plasma. The same MD code. And what are you changing? the forces, everything about the material property is entering through the forces. So this is where you spend most of your time. The rest of it, like I said, just trust what other people did and spend all your time thinking about what are the forces I need for my particular problem. We spend in my group a lot, of, I'll talk about some of the stuff we've done in my group, spend a lot of time developing force laws because it is the most important physics material input. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about two issues that are very generic. And, and then we'll get into specific potentials and I'll give you kind of a catalog of the sort of potentials that you can choose from. But here's one of the issues that's very generic. Your, your simulation is always going to be a finite size. And because it's always a finite size, you're always going to take your potential and cut it off. And that's going to look like this. Your real potential 
is going to come down and it's going to go to infinity. Imagine it's a Coulomb potential or some potential that you use. It, in reality, it goes out to infinity, but your code is a finite size and you're not going to compute force laws out to infinity. So what are you going to do? You're going to cut it off. And if this is the potential and the force is minus the gradient of the potential, what is the force right here? It's infinite. This in an MD code is a disaster. So if, and every single MD code has this problem because there's no MD code that does an infinite number of particles, not yet anyway. So you always have this. And even if you don't think you put it there, you did. <laughs> it, it, it has to be there somewhere because at some point you ran out of particles, you ran out of computational power. So what people do to fix this, there's a bunch of ways of fixing it, as you can imagine, yeah. because it's super important and it's a very generic problem. One thing to do is you just shift it. And that's what you see here. Yeah. You just take the potential and you shift it up. And now it goes right to zero. And when it gets to zero, you just leave it at zero. Okay, does anybody see a problem with that? It has two problems. One, it's not the same potential anymore. The depth of this potential right here is now different. So if this is like a bond, it's weaker. The other thing is, if you shift a potential, it doesn't change the derivative. So even though this made the potential smooth, it didn't make the force smooth. Cannot repair glitches and forces. So this is a whole subject of study. I'm not going to go into any more detail here, but I just want you to be aware that this happens in MD codes. People have come up with tricks that shift it and also bend it a little bit so that you can get a smooth potential and a smooth force. And that, and that was, it's going to mess up your potential, but at least you don't have this infinite glitch right there. So something just to be aware of, if you choose like a cutoff radius that's really small, you're gonna get a really big cut and you're gonna see these glitches. If you monitor energy conservation, it's gonna cause your energy um, as a function of time to have all these jumps. You, you'll see it. Next time you run an MD code, choose a small cutoff radius and you'll see all of your energies will be jumping all over the place. That's a generic problem. Another problem that, that sometimes comes up is, should you take your potential and treat it analytically or should you treat it as a tabulated quantity? And you might ask yourself, why would you do that? There's a couple of reasons why you might do this. The first reason is um, sometimes the analytic potential can be very expensive to evaluate. Whereas if you just have a table and you just need to do interpolation, interpolation can be quite fast. And I did this once and made a code orders of magnitude faster by tabulating it. It's not always the case, but sometimes taking a very expensive potential and tabulating it makes your code orders of magnitude faster. Um, so something to consider. Um, the other thing is sometimes the potential that you made was came out of a numerical calculation. So it came to you tabulated. There is no analytic form. And I'll talk about some of those in a few minutes. So you might want to think about, just be aware, some potentials are analytic. Some of them are tabulated. And if you're tabulated, you're going to have to interpolate them. And so just be aware of what you're doing. You know, when you write a code or you're using a code, what are you doing? Is your interpolation scheme accurate enough? All the usual issues come up there. So just those are two generic issues, glitches at the cutoff radius and whether or not you're tabulating. Okay, here's a paper. If you, if you do tabulated potentials, it's basically people have researched this, so there's no reason for you to reinvent it. Um, so there's lots of papers out there to help you out. Okay, now let's talk about different force laws in the last 15 minutes that we have here uh, for this part. And the force laws in MD are these. Sometimes you have just a lot of them. So let me walk through what some of these are, because if you have a complicated biochemical system with large macromolecules, you might have a Hamiltonian with lots of different force laws with lots of different dependencies. So let's just look at what some of these are. 
So by far the most important one, sorry, this got shifted here, is the Leonard Jones potential. I think this is the one I see absolutely the most in the literature. Um, and part of the reason for that is it's simple. You can see it here. It's sometimes called the 12 six. There's a 12 here, if you can see it. Sorry, it got covered and a six here. It's called the Leonard Jones 12 six. Has two parameters, epsilon, which is the well depth and sigma, which is this distance right here. So here's epsilon and here's sigma. So they, the parameters correspond to these physical energies and lengths. It's beautiful because it gives us extremely rich phase diagram, which is consistent with a lot of liquids, like liquid argon, these types of, of fluids. It's, it, it, it allows for an amazingly rich set of states. And it's amazing that this simple potential predicts all of these states. So if you, if you know for your particular system where your system is super critical, where it, it solidifies, if you know those things, you can adjust epsilon and sigma, and it will take this phase diagram and stretch it to be like your material. And then you have a nice Leonard Jones potential that gives you a phase diagram that's sort of a distorted version of, of this one. So, um, so quite nice. The reason it's able to do that is it has a repulsion. So that's like this kind of a hard sphere repulsion, but at very low energies, very low temperatures, it can form these bonds because of this well, which is controlled by the depth epsilon. And that makes things stick together. And that's how you make things like liquids. And that's how you make things like solids. If you had purely repulsive potential, you would not be able to have a phase diagram this complicated because you couldn't form like surface tension, for example. So Leonard Jones is one you absolutely need to know about because everybody uses it. Um, if you do use it, you can just go out to the literature and probably find the parameters. Like this is just some examples I found out there on the web. If I'm doing an oxygen, oxygen, these are my parameters. If I'm doing nitrogen, nitrogen, these are my parameters. And you just go look it up. Argon silicon, these are the sigma and epsilon. People have tabulated these, they've calculated these. So it's always a good place to start. If you have a physical system that's got a complicated mixture or not even a mixture, even if it's oxygen, oxygen, carbon, carbon. If you need to have a simple potential to start with, start with Leonard Jones, the parameters may be known or you might be able to get something nearby and not have to calculate them. Sometimes you just have to calculate them, but that's a very common one. There's other forms. So if you go out to the literature, just be aware, not everybody uses epsilon and sigma. This form uses A and B. This one uses an R naught, which is, has a slightly different definition than sigma. So just be careful when you go to the literature because not everybody is consistent in all of the papers and all of the tables. Okay, sometimes people generalize these. Um, this is the me potential, um, which is sometimes called the NM Leonard Jones. It has this prefactor out here, which doesn't really matter. It's just like gets the right normalization. But the important thing is it allows you to vary this, which was 12, and this, which was six. You can make it whatever you want. Like maybe for the physical problem that you're working on, it's better to have 10, five. Um, we've done stuff with N up to like 50 or 60. It makes like a hard sphere type interaction. So you can you can vary these numbers to get whatever you don't have to, you don't have to stick with 12, six. The nice thing about 12, six is that a lot of people have tabulated it. And if you come up with another like 10, five or 50, 20 or whatever, less likely you're going to find the parameters. You might have to calculate them yourself, but you don't need to stick with uh, Leonard Jones 12, six. Another option that you see that's an embellishment of these is to keep the six. People like the six, that attractive tail, one over R to the six, people like it, but they don't always like that one over R to the 12th. And so here's an example, the Buckingham potential or sometimes called E6 replaces the 12th part, the one over R to the 12 with an exponential. This is the E6, that's why it's called the E6 potential. It has this behavior, it's a little bit odd. The first time I, we, I used this once in a paper and it has, a, it has an odd behavior because it goes up and if you look at it, it eventually turns back over. 
And that's because this ends up being stronger than this as R goes to zero. Because as R goes to zero, this is going to infinity and this isn't. So that's why it turns over. And it always worried me that my particles would go over this well and they would get stuck to each other at zero separation. Um, but in practice, that never happens. And the reason it doesn't happen is because you're going to choose, given your density and your temperature, you're going to choose the A, B, and C to be consistent with your system physically. And that's going to make this height high enough such that at your temperature, particles can never go over this. And so it works out in the end, even though it might look like it won't. E6 is actually pretty, pretty common as well. Here's some examples. This is kind of uh, interesting, very interesting if you're in the if you need to make your own potential. So often you will, someone will do a very expensive calculation. They'll give you these black circles. It's a very common situation. And what can you do? You could tabulate it. If you want to use a tabular potential, good, tabulate it. But you might, for your particular application, you might think, oh, it's faster for me to have everything analytic because I can, it's fast to evaluate. I can take the derivative analytically, much better for me to do that. So what they did here is they took three different forms and they fit it. And you can see that the blue and the orange, the Leonard Jones and the Buckingham, they're nice potentials and they do a pretty good job, but they're really quite bad at large R. But there's another potential called the Morse potential, which when they fit it to the Morse potential, it actually fits much better. So if you end up having data that you need to fit to, you might always want to try to fit to multiple forms because the Leonard Jones 12.6 might be okay, but it may not be great. So you have to be careful when you're, when you're taking data and making analytic potentials out of it. Here's the Morse potential that I just talked about. This is what it looks like mathematically. It has a very special purpose. It's a really interesting potential. What it does is it comes down from infinity. It looks almost harmonic in this part of the potential, as you can see, as compared to the harmonic. And then it goes up and then it goes to a level value. And that value that it goes to is called the dissociation energy. What does it mean? If I take these two particles and put them really close to each other at low energy, they're going to stick together around this radius and be like a little harmonic oscillator. They're just going to do this, just like you'd expect. But if I did that with a real spring, they could never get apart. But the Morse potential allows them to get apart because if you pull it far enough away from each other, above the dissociation energy, there becomes no force anymore. So if I pull it apart, it's hard to pull apart, but as soon as I get it far enough, they're separated. So it allows me in my molecular dynamics code to form diatomic molecules. And if something hits it hard enough, it could actually break it apart. It's a very cool potential and very simple. So harmonic, obviously, this is a very, very obvious one. You know what it is. It's like a Morse potential, but you can't break it apart. It keeps on going up to infinity. You, there's no dissociation energy. Sometimes that's what you want because you don't want your bonds to break apart. Like if you have hydrogen bonds or something, the harmonic part could be in space. It could be an angle. So you could have harmonic angular potentials as opposed to uh, spatial ones, either one. Um, let me talk a little bit about Coulomb potentials. All of the potentials I've talked about so far I hope they work for your problem. And the reason I hope they work for you is because they are short ranged and you could make a nice cutoff radius. Everything's nice. Um, you can do a little shift or something and it's great. It's gonna be fast. Your MD code is gonna be like order N. It's gonna work on parallel machines really well. It's all good. If you're unlucky and you're working on electrolytes, colloids, biology, plasmas, you might find that the potentials are long range. And the, the worst, worst of them is Coulomb, which is what you find in um, like electrolytes and plasmas. And these potentials are just completely different. 
the, the code has to be completely rewritten to do these types of potentials. And the class of uh, algorithms that are used for long range potentials are called Ewald methods. So if you're ever doing a long range potential, even if it's like a dipole or a Coulomb potential, you have to add to your code an Ewald type method or if you're using like lamps or some other code, I don't know what you're using, you wanna turn this on. And if you don't, you literally get the wrong answer. It's not like it's inaccurate, it's like really wrong. Um, it's just long range potentials are really different. Now, the other thing, just like you, you've probably noticed a pattern, all these methods are kind of old. So we have lots of integrators, we have lots of thermostats, we have lots of different potentials, we have lots of options. Same thing with Ewald. There's the classic Ewald, there's particle mesh Ewald, particle, particle, particle mesh. We've written some papers on that. Um, and so there's a bunch of different methods and there's even methods that are do the same thing, but they're different, like fast multipole method. They all sum these long range interactions. You just gotta be aware of them. Pick the one that suits your problem. Typically people today use particle, particle mesh. It's usually called P cubed M for obvious reasons. It's typically the fastest because it exploits uh, very fast parallel uh, Fourier methods like the package FFTW. Um, it, basically the Ewald method breaks, the, breaks your problem into two pieces, one of which is really fast in real space and one of which is really fast in reciprocal space or Fourier space. And that allows you to do, use very fast FFTW like libraries, which are massively parallel. But you have to use them when, when you have a long range potential and they typically will make your code very slow. So if you're comparing a code with a short range interaction and you can do 10 million particles, you probably can't do that if you have a long range interaction because these Ewald class methods are, are basically much more expensive. Okay, dipoles are, are, are something that's fairly common. They're also long range. So you gotta be careful if you have dipoles. Okay, some, some potentials are spherical. Dipoles are not only long range, but they're also not spherical. Not all potentials are spherical. Now, one class of potentials that's, that's very common, and maybe some of you are doing this if you're using codes like Abinit or Quantum Espresso or VASP, they actually compute the potentials on the fly. We don't always know what the potential is in advance because we might have a bunch of particles doing some complicated thing and they're compressed on top of each other. It's not going to be Leonard Jones. It's not going to be one of these other simple ones. We kind of, we got to calculate it every time. And sometimes we have to do that at every single time step. So what we do is we freeze the ions and we do a quantum mechanical calculation of what the electrons are doing every single time step. This is insanely expensive. And what happens is you just compute the potential on the fly. As the simulation is going, every time step you stop, recompute the quantum mechanics, recompute the forces, evolve the ions, recompute again over and over and over again. Okay. And then you get here's sort of an algorithm. There's a bunch of different methods to, to use. If you're doing this, you've already heard of these. The most common is cone sham. Cone, cone sham, like people call it DFT MD or cone sham MD. This is the most common. If you're like me and you do plasma physics, you use cone sham Merman because that gives you finite temperature. Very expensive. You can kind of read through this. This is sort of how it works. This is just the algorithm. You can read it faster than I can read it. Um, but it's basically move the ions, compute the forces quantum mechanically, move the ions, and you just go back and forth. These, these are limited to very, very small numbers of particles. We recently wrote a paper using this and we used 64 particles, which is interesting because that's what Fermi, Pasta, Ulam, and Singu used in 1955. So even from 1955 to 2020, if you do on-the-fly potentials, you have to use the same number of particles. It's interesting. It's that expensive. Okay. Since I'm kind of running out of time, let me... Um, that's just the self-consistent field calculation. Okay, so let me, let me answer this final question before we break, which is how can you make, make that faster? That is, this, this is so expensive. What, is there anything we can do? So people invented a really cool trick. 
um, which is this. What if we do the expensive calculation just for a little while? And while we do that, we calculate the best pair potential. And once we know that simple pair potential, we put it in another code that's faster because it just does pair potentials. So imagine I run VASP, compute a pair potential. Once I have it, I put that potential in lamps, something like that. And then it runs orders of magnitude faster. There's two ways of doing this. One's called force matching, and I'll show some results that we got last year on this. And another one is structure matching. But basically, you take a physical quantity from the expensive simulation, and you guess what your potential is until you match the expensive one. And once your, your potential matches the expensive one, you take that potential and you put it into an MD code that runs very fast. And it should be almost as accurate as the expensive code because you made it match. And so it's really nice, really nice. So this gets into the generalization of this, which is what are called machine learned potentials. And this of course brings us up to the modern era. This is 2020, everybody's using machine learning for everything. Um, and you can use all different types of machine learning um, techniques like symbolic regressions, nice. Most people, of course, use neural networks, but these approaches attempt to capture the expensive simulation in the best possible way. That's what the machine learning is doing. And once you have a model, a neural network, you use that in your fast code. And I think I've seen people do this where they capture this complicated behavior with the neural network. I think I've seen cases where the simulation was a billion times faster. It's pretty significant in some cases how much faster this can be. So definitely what you wanna do if you're building your own complicated potentials, you definitely wanna pay attention to machine learning. Um, here's an example. This is uh, a paper from uh, my graduate student, Luke Stanek. And here's an example of what we, we did. This I think is the last slide. Um, for this first part. And this is the force error versus temperature for carbon. And this is the force match. So this is a machine learned potential. And it's more accurate by almost a half an order of magnitude. And SNAP is a potential from Sandia National Laboratory from uh, Mitch Wood. Mitch Wood gave us that one. It's a four body machine learned potential. And it gives us basically another order of magnitude of accuracy. So the force match potentials are much more accurate. What does that mean? If I can get a really accurate machine learned potential and put it in a fast code, what does that mean? I can go from 64 particles to tens of thousands of particles. And now I can look at certain issues in MD codes I couldn't look at before. Like here's a physical quantity, which is the diffusion coefficient. And I bet some of you are interested in the diffusion coefficient. If you want to know the diffusion coefficient, it very much, the value you predict very much depends on the size of the box or equivalently how many particles you have. So this is showing the number dependence of the diffusion coefficient. And it's showing you if you have too few particles, you get the wrong answer. So you need to run a simulation with a lot of particles. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to use a machine learned potential. So I would highly recommend focusing on machine learned potentials um, for getting really accurate calculations and basically using two MD codes. Okay, so this gets me to my last slide for this first part. So in summary, uh, choose your integrator and your time step correctly for every problem. Um, a lot of people just take time steps off the web. You need to adapt it for your problem. Um, mm -hmm. If the integrator doesn't exist for your problem, you might want to invent one. Like, like I mentioned, what if you have magnetic fields? What happens? Um, that's something to keep in mind, or at least, you know, choose a small time step, choose a velocity relay, you might be safe. Think about what statistical ensemble you're in. I talked a lot about thermostats and microcanonical ensemble, but you might be, like I said, at constant pressure. Go research barostats, but you need to think about what statistical ensemble are you in, how you equilibrate your system to that ensemble to make it mimic physical reality that you're trying to describe. 
then what is the physics of your problem? Is there a bath? Is there an environment? Use Langevin. What are the forces? Do you need two body potentials, three body on the fly potentials? Maybe you need that. If you have on the fly potentials, can you use machine learning to speed up that and get rid of those finite size error effects? So there's lots of issues that we discovered. I think that you can help help do a good job with MD. Obviously in this one and a half hours, I didn't, didn't cover a huge number of topics. The two that I felt I really missed were boundary conditions. Um, and another one was what happens if I have like external forces, like I want to put a laser on this or something like that. There's, it's a huge topic. I teach a whole class. It's a semester long. This was only an hour and a half. So there's lots more topics. Um, but with that, let me stop. And um, I'm happy to take any questions or we can go to tea time. Yeah, thank you, Professor Murillo, for this elaborated talk. You teach us some basics of molecular dynamics. You covered the integrators, the thermostats, and of course, in the end, the, you talked about the potential. And you also gave us an idea that people are all, already stepped into adopting machine learning techniques. So yes, are there any questions from the people online? They can unmute themselves or they can ask questions. Or are there any questions from people in this room? So while they are thinking, Professor Murillo, I have a couple of questions. Sure. sure. Yeah, you mentioned, I'm not comfortable with this idea of stochastic. I mean, my ability to grasp that. Because we are solving the exact equations and we are solving a deterministic problem. Mm -hmm. So the stochastic stochasticity we need to include why will while we calculate the thermodynamic parameter or is it inherent of this molecular dynamic simulations so as i mentioned there's sort of two ways that it arises one way is indirect where we use random numbers to generate the initial conditions once right. you've done that of course it's deterministic after that but what you might do in some cases is you might choose some random numbers, do a deterministic simulation, choose the random numbers again, do another deterministic simulation, choose the random numbers again, do another deterministic simulation, and then you're going to average these like an ensemble. And that's where yeah. the randomness comes in is averaging over initial conditions. That's a very special time type of stochasticness, but that's one type. The second type is more direct, where the integrator itself uses random numbers. So during the simulation, the particles are getting kicked around literally randomly. And you use stochastic differential equations. In fact, I didn't talk about this too much because I didn't have time. But when you have stochastic differential equations because you have a bath of particles, and they really are random, you have to be careful how you develop the integrators because stochastic differential equations typically have different integrators than ordinary differential. But that comes in when you have like Langevin type equation. Right. Right, thank you. I need to study more about this Langevin thermostat. The next right. question, the short question I have that we come across this LG potential. Mm -hmm. But we know all the interactions are basically the electromagnetic interaction in this case. So how does, how does this manifest from those interactions? And how do we get this R power 6 and R power 12 terms? Yeah, that's a good question. What's happening there is there are other types of um, physical effects, one of which is polarization. So what happens in like a... a 12 6 the reason people like the six part is because what's happening is if i have two atoms there's going to be fluctuations they're not perfectly spherical so if one of them has a fluctuation it causes the other one to get polarized and if this one's polarized it causes this one to be polarized so what it's basically doing is it's taking into account the fact 
that there's always fluctuations that lead to slight amounts of polarization. Because if you think about it as purely a spherical particle, it, you would not get the right answer. You're absolutely correct about that. Right. So if I understood it correctly, so these terms come when we do the multipole expansion of the potential. Yes. If, if you were to derive the actual potential from scratch and do a multipole right. expansion, you would find that if you put two atoms next to each other, that they would be slightly polarized. Right. All right. Right. And one last small question that you talked about machine learning. So how do you get these data sets to train the architecture? So the way we did it in this paper was, is it uses a pretty common technique. What we used was the code VASP and we ran VASP as long as we could. It's very expensive. And we write these giant files and in the files are forces and particle positions. And then what we do is we use a, a code that reads all that data in and it minimizes a loss function as a function of a non-parametric potential. And it does simulated annealing. And the simulated annealing adjusts all possible potentials. It searches in the, in the space of all possible functions. And it keeps checking for this function. Does it look like what's in the data set? No. Change the function. Does that look like what's in the data set? No. Change the function. And it just sits there. It's very slow. And it just keeps adjusting the potential until that potential produces the force law that is in this giant file of data. And then once it's done, we take that potential and stick it into lamps. Wow, oh, interesting. It That's is how worth we do it. At. I mean, there's a lot of ways of doing it, obviously. Okay. Okay, thank you, sir. Are there sure. any questions from anyone else?